This, by the way, mm -hmm. is Kawan. He is my Brazilian godson. He is now 13 years old, and we'll see more of him later. I will warn you that my talk today is in two parts. One part are the slides which I uploaded to the website in which you have. And the second part will follow the first part, so please don't leave when I'm finished the first part. I'll also warn you that I may cut into the coffee break a little bit. You are free to leave if you wish, but I don't think you'll want to. Today I'm here to talk about Subitai. It is software that is made by the company that I work for, which is named Opt-in. We call it Opt-in because when you are hit with spam and email, you can opt out of that email. We think you want to opt in to using our software. What we offer is open source, peer-to-peer -peer cloud computing, which also treats the Internet of Things the right way. We also do cryptocurrency mining for everybody. And you'll see throughout the talk how that works together. Now, why open source peer-to-peer -peer cloud software? The problem with a lot of the cloud companies is that they are very big, they are centralized, and most of the time they are centralized in the United States. Now, I come from the United States, and I love my country. But it's some of the things we do that I hate. And one of the things we do is we spy on other people, particularly people in Latin America. Well, we spy on everybody. We spy on the Chinese. We spy on the Germans. But Latin America, we really seem to like to spy on. And it's also expensive. I mean, a lot of people use Google Mail and they say, hey, I don't pay for it. But if you start to use more and more and more cloud services, you find out that the monthly bill you get is a lot of money. And it doesn't treat the Internet of Things very well. Now, some people call the Internet of Things the fog because they're out there on, in amongst us. And if what you have to do is take all of your data from your things and send them all the way back to Redmond, Washington, or to Minnesota, or to wherever the cloud companies are located, that's a lot of data which is traveling there. And a lot of the cloud companies say, oh, I have local uh, computational facilities or storage facilities. I have them in 40 countries. Well, that's great, except for the fact that there's 200 countries in the world. And so 160 of those countries do not have the cloud computation in them. And the cloud companies say, yes, w we can help you make sure that the data you have is stored in a particular place, is computed in a particular place. But can you be absolutely sure that they can do that or not. You basically have lost control of your resources, particularly in privacy and security. Now, as I said, I love my country, but after 2001, we came up with this thing called the Patriot Act, which basically means that if I, as an American citizen, who have my rights protected by my laws and my constitution, talk with you, a Brazilian, well, I could be talking about terrorism. And all of a sudden, these organizations, like the NSA and the CIA and the FBI, can say, well, we're investigating terrorism, so we get to look at the data which you're exchanging. And we don't need the typical safeguards that a U.S. citizen would have if they're conversing with another U.S. citizen. This is bad. And it's bad for a couple of reasons. It's bad because you are Brazilians. How many of you are not Brazilians? I may be talking to the wrong crowd. Oh, you're not Brazilian? Okay. Are you, are you from Latin America? 
Colombia, okay, but you're not a U.S. citizen. See, if I'm talking with you, I could be talking about terrorism or drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, they have every right in the world to capture all of my data. And this is bad. Especially bad when countries have legal means or legal needs to store their data in a particular place. For example, if you're a hospital, there are privacy concerns that means that a hospital has to store their data in a particular place. If you're a bank, you may have a need to store that data in a particular place. And IoT is going to make this even more of a nightmare, Internet of Things. So enter Supatai. This was started as a defense contract from an agency, it wasn't US, but if I told you who they were, I'd have to kill you all. <laughs> and the agency had a problem. They had secret data, and they had top secret data. And the top secret data, the organization that created it, was very well funded. They had lots of computers and lots of things. And the poor secret people didn't have all that money, but their, but their work they were doing was very important. And so what the agency wanted to do was share their resources between the two, but keep the top secret data from being seen by the people that were only secret. Don't you wish you had these type of problems? We call these first world problems, except it was not in a first world country. <laughs> so. The CTO and founder of our company, Optin, a person by the name of Alex Karasulu, who had been doing lots of work for the Apache Foundation for a very long time. Alex had written some of the very interesting code the Apache Foundation needs. And he took this on as a consulting contract, and they created what we call PeerOS, a cloud which is highly authenticated, highly encrypted peer-to-peer -peer software. And so every single one of your, com your computers can participate in this cloud, supplying resources or buying resources. And we'll get to that in a moment. That part is completely open source, completely free. You can download the software. You don't even have to talk to us. We don't even have to know that you're using it. Now, if you want to buy and sell resources from somebody outside of your organization, we have a marketplace, a little bit like Google Store or Apple Store, where you can buy and sell resources there. And finally, we have a piece of hardware, which is optional, which acts as a broad broadband router and does a variety of things, which we'll get to in a moment. So let's take a look at PROS itself. It's container-based, so you use LXC uh, containers, just like all the other clouds. You can share or barter your resources amongst all these computers that are using it. And you can easily create a small cloud to take care of your Internet of Things. So this means that the computation of the data for your Internet of Things is done close to the things themselves and can be kept separate from the rest of your cloud. Now, why is this important? Let me give you a real-life example. There was a bus company that wanted to be able to see if there were any empty seats on the bus. And so they had a little webcam at the front of the bus and they use computer vision to sense the people coming into the bus and the number of seats that were empty. And then the application could tell somebody on their cell phone where they should take this bus that was coming up to them or wait for the next bus because the next bus actually had some empty seats. So they had two ways of computing this. The first way was sending all of the raw data from the webcam back to a cloud the computation was done in the cloud and sent to the cell phones. But after only one day, 
they realized that the charges for the data communications were so high that they could afford to buy a computer, stick it in the bus, do all of that computation, and then send only the message, yes, there are seats, or there are no seats. And in one day, they saved enough money by doing the local computation to pay for that computer on the bus. Multiply that by the number of buses, the number of bus companies, and you can see the amount of data that is saved by doing that. That's treating IoT the right way. Now, we can do this, and we can bring together consumers and providers of resources. Now, you may be a telecommunications company. You have a lot of computers in your facility. But when it comes to cloud services, those were taken away from you by Amazon and Google and other big cloud companies. You cannot sell those services because people bypass you and go directly to those clouds. You could be an electric company operator, like a Taipu, the world's largest electric plant, and what you want to do is help people save electricity by using Internet of Things. Now, why would a typo want people to save electricity? I mean, they sell electricity. They should want to sell as much as possible. It's because if they can help people control their electricity, then that means that they may not have to start up the more expensive coal-fired and oil-fired power plants. They may not have to build another Itaipu. And so Itaipu is trying very desperately to use Internet of Things to help to save electricity. And these people can become what we call economy operators. They can sell the resources they have to their customers. Or they can utilize the resources of their customers to help meet their demands and needs. Let's say you're a university. I've heard there's a university near here. Let's say you're a university and you have a lot of systems that you keep up all the time. You could sell those excess resources to people that need them automatically without you having to do anything except listing your resources for sale up on the bazaar, our store. So you could become a participant in this cloud economy and not just a consumer. The blockchain router, this little board I showed you, this is the version 1.0 of the board. As I'm speaking at the University of Sao Paulo, we are producing the second version of this board. It will be available in October in mass sale. It is a powerful wireless router, broadband router, just like the one you have in your homes or your, or your companies. It does 802.11, BGNN, as well as other types of wireless and wired internet. But it also has a place on it for an Arduino shield, and it has 40 GPIO pins compatible with the Raspberry Pi. And so if you develop an Internet of Things application using a Raspberry Pi or using an Arduino, you can take that shield and put it on the router, and the router will now run those programs for you. Now, why would you want the router to do that? Because it has a separate processor and a separate version of the operating system that constantly looks at the packets going in and out of your router to see if there's any viruses on there or any spam. It actually uses an artificially intelligent uh, algorithm is developed by Aheho of Aho, Weinberger, and Kernigan, who wrote the AUK program. It is very, very secure. In addition to this, it has controllers on there for RAID. It can do, do RAID 0 through 10. So this becomes a NAS server 
for you. Why is that important? Well, let's say you take pictures or you store music or you have other types of data. And yes, you probably want to have that backed up to the cloud, heavily encrypted. But you also want to have it local to you. Because why is it that every time you want to look at a picture or every time you want to listen to music or every time you want to look at a video, you have to pull it across from your cloud provider and pay money for it? It's part of your internet charges. You can store that on your local server and, of course, back it up to the cloud whatever way you want to. So that allows you to have a much lower internet connection, but yet still get the speeds you want for 4K TV and other things. The last thing which this machine does is it mines cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency is the big thing in the world. Everybody's looking at cryptocurrency. And people want to mine cryptocurrency. Some people are using GPUs for that. And ha fully half the people who hate cryptocurrency hate it because people are mining cryptocurrency with GPUs. They say it's using too much electricity. It's going to burn up the planet. And all the GPU people are going and building their factories near hydroelectric plants and near thermo plants and solar plants because that's where they're getting the cheaper electricity from. But that's a losing battle. The other people use ASICs. And ASICs are wonderful because they're very efficient and they can mine cryptocurrency very fast. But the problem is that they are fixed. And once you create your ASIC, if the algorithm changes just a little bit, the ASIC is worthless. So we use an FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. I used to program those back in 1969. But they would fill this room, and they would cost multiple millions of dollars. And they were very simple. Today, you could buy one for $21 put it on a USB stick, and it does 50,000 times more than what I programmed in 1969. We have one in our router. And at current rates, it will mine about $50 worth of cryptocurrency every day. Oh, sorry, every month, every month. But that doesn't sound like a lot, $50. But if that $50 goes to a person who otherwise cannot afford the internet, then over time, that $50 will not only pay for the router, but also pay for their internet services. And now, the digitally disadvantaged people will also be able to have access to the internet to get education. And we're working on even newer models that will mine 100 times that amount. Now, with an FPGA, if the algorithm changes, you simply reprogram it. Is it as efficient as an ASIC? No. It's about 20 to 50 percent less efficient. But it's 1,000 times more efficient than a GPU. And so we think that this is the sweet spot. As I said, this is being produced at the University of Sao Paulo. We're having all, a lot of the parts made here in Brazil by Brazilians. And it's part of a program we call Caninos Lucos. In addition, the entire electrical utilization of this board, including the cryptocurrency mining, is 18 watts. A Linksys router that does not do NAS, that does not do cryptocurrency mining, uses 36 watts. So we are very efficient. We're also using cryptocurrency in our transactions. We have two types of cryptocurrency. One is called Khan. It's named after Genghis Khan. And every time you say Khan, you have to say it like this, Khan. Okay? And then the other type we have is goodwill. Now, goodwill is a very lightweight type of digital currency. We don't want to call it a cryptocurrency because it's very lightweight. 
you don't want to have to do $20 worth of cryptocurrency mining to buy 10 cents worth of CPU time. So we invented Goodwill. And Goodwill can be earned by people simply by installing our software or helping other people use our software. We're writing something we call blueprints. And blueprints are something we'll talk about later, but it's especially interesting to this group. You can earn goodwill any number of ways. And then you can buy and sell resources with this goodwill with other people in the network. Eventually, we can also contribute your goodwill to open source projects who need resources. And so some of the, uh, some of the uh, projects we have need to have disk space, need to have computational power, and you can contribute your goodwill that you earn to them so that they can use it. Goodwill can also be converted into con. Now, con is a real currency and can be used to buy many things. It's an Ethereum-based currency, and it will be bought and sold through the exchanges as well as through our, our facilities. Um, we also use con for a very special thing. How many of you have ever used resources from a cloud provider and the cloud provider just not do what they said they were going to do? They broke their contract with you. They didn't, and, and then you say, well, I can sue you for that. Oh, good, try and sue Google. Try and sue you know, Microsoft. Try and sue Amazon. Yeah, you'll get a long way. But what we do with con is we make these people put their con in escrow. And so if they violate your contract, and we can find out if they have, then you automatically get that con. You get paid back what you paid for those resources. So your suppliers have to obey their service level agreement, we call it. Have to obey their contract. And this is making con a useful monetary value in the marketplace. Now we get to blueprints, and this is very important. I told you that we use container-based systems for providing, the, for running this on top of our, of our systems. Also, if you use a Google app engine or you've written any type of Google apps, they run binary compatible on top of Subutai. And Subutai containers actually run on top of the big cloud providers too. So there's really no penalty in writing to our containers. But blueprints allow your program to find the resources it needs. Because when you run a program, you need two things. You need the program itself, and you need the resources to run it on. Whether it be a server someplace, whether it be disk storage, whether it be computational power, you need resources. And if you're a small business owner, you may not know where to get those resources. But if you have a application that has a blueprint, you click on the blueprint, it launches the application that you need, and it finds the resources for you using artificially intelligent software. So you don't have to worry about finding those resources. And if you have either con or goodwill, you can pay for those resources automatically. Now, a lot of people listen to this and they say, okay, this is, um, this is field test software, or when's this gonna happen? It's actually been in existence a long time. We're now on version seven of the code, it's very stable. The bazaars are up and operating around the world. They are federated bazaars, so if one goes down, the other ones take over. The super type blockchain router, as I said, the engineering design samples are being done at the University of Sao Paulo today and will be available in October for people to buy. We have signed several memorandums of understandings with large companies around Brazil. For example, we've signed one with PTI, who's the research arm of Itaipu. They love our router because they say we need the security that your router gives us 
so that the Internet of Things will not affect our hydroelectric plant. We've, we're looking at several other large industry giants inside of Brazil and Latin America. But this is not just a Latin American project, this is worldwide. So why Latin America, why Brazil? Because I've been coming to Brazil since 1994. And I see the amount of open source that Brazilians use and the, what, and the things that Brazilians do with it. The other people in our company come from other countries. And we are all open source. And we believe that Brazil and Latin America is ready for a cloud product that they own. You know, we don't sell cloud services. We do not. We only make the software that allows you to sell cloud services. That's what we do. And so we believe that our product line is unique. We believe it's ready to, to allow you to make money with it or to save money with it, to have privacy with it. And we are ready to release the router in large quantities in Q3 of this year. So that is the first talk, and all of the slides are up on the web. And now I'm going to give you the second talk, which I had not planned until just this morning. I am, I have a lot of hats that I wear. I am the CEO of Optin, the company I just, that makes supertized software. I am the board chairman of the Linux Professional Institute that does certification of open source professionals. I'm the president of a project called Project Kawan, which we'll get to in a moment. And I'm the co-founder and advisor of a project called Caninas Lucas, which is to create inexpensive single-board computers designed and manufactured here in Brazil. A lot of people know something about me. There's a lot of stuff on this slide, but in reality, the only two important parts are that I've been coming to Latin America since 1994, Next year, it will be one quarter of a century. Sounds like a lot. I've been using Linux and Unix for a very long time, and I've been programming since 1969. Next year, a half century. But one of the things I am, and I'm proud of it, is I'm pragmatic. Yes, I believe that everything should be open, and you'll see in a moment how much I believe that. But I also believe that we sometimes have to go there in footsteps, not giant leaps. And we just have to keep have to moving forward. So the very first thing that's of importance here, and you've been hearing this whole time in the previous talk and even the OpenSUSE talk before that, is about open source. Of course, we understand what that means. But that people all over the world, in countries all over the world, can contribute to open source projects. It doesn't have to be done just by a single person. And this is why there are now hundreds of thousands of projects out in places like GitHub that people can look at and use by pulling down, compiling it, or even pulling down binary packages and running. And that you can use the money that's normally paid for proprietary products and instead turn that around and pay for young programmers programming here in Brazil. Now, how many of you have ever pirated closed source software? It's okay, I won't tell anybody. You could how many of you? Yeah. Because copyright is a terrible thing, right? 
why should anybody have copyright on software? But the problem with pirating software is that you are taking away money from people who wrote that software to make a living. It's illegal, and actually, without copyright, we'd have no way of enforcing copyleft. All software would be in the public domain. Anybody could use the software to create any type of binary software they wanted to, and open source would have no meaning. Instead, we have copyright, which we then give away as a license of copyleft. And make no mistake about it, open source isn't good enough. Because open source gives the right of the software producer to use the code, but extends no right to the software user to have the facility of being able to change that or make it better. Open source is not good enough. But with free software, you can make a living. You can cut the expenses of developing new software down to the point where people can do that. You can open up the world to a better, wider space of creating software for people's needs. And there's a lot of people in Brazil, as an example, who are trained in universities paid for by taxpayers, federal universities, or who are good enough to have received a scholarship to a private university, who then get some experience and leave Brazil because they feel that there is no good jobs in Brazil, no interesting jobs in Brazil, they want to go to Silicon Valley, they want to go to Europe, they want to go to Asia because they feel that's where the interesting jobs are. And Brazil has a terrible problem with brain drain. So what's the other problem when that happens? The other problem is that when companies want to come here and they want to do research or they want to do very technical research type of things, they can't find all the people they need. There is a problem finding people of that level of expertise here in Brazil. That's why you have a whole series of companies surrounding the university here. They're hoping to capture some of those people that are trained. But I've had too many good Brazilians leave Brazil to go to Facebook, to go to you know, Google, because they feel that's where the interesting jobs are. So the very first thing we should be doing here is insisting that our universities teach using open source and free software. Because when you teach using open source or free software, you teach three times. When you teach with proprietary software, you teach only once. You teach how that proprietary software helps the student solve their problems. But when you use open source, or free software, you teach three times. How do you use the software to solve your problems? How does the software solve those problems? And how can you help to make that software better to solve your problems? Three times. And so we should not, at this point, be accepting from our university professors that it's OK to teach using closed source not in Brazil. And please don't accept the fact that these companies like Oracle and Microsoft and Adobe give free licenses to universities. Because when you try and use that software outside the university, maybe in a job or something like that, that's when you find out that the software is not free or even gratis. Now, if you are a company that's looking for a programmer, why not hire an open source developer? Because those people can also write closed source software, they could, and they know how to leverage the open source community. So even if you're writing 
closed source software or a portion of your software is closed source, you really should hire an open source programmer because they can help you twice. And I'll take a little time here to advertise an IoT training course developed at the University of Sao Paulo, completely gratis, in English, Portuguese, and Spanish, on how to program IoT. 50,000 students have already taken this course. Now, I'll tell you about how in 2002, I helped to bring 100 and 101 paper exams to Sao Paulo with the company for Linux, who's the sponsor of this event, to certify the first Brazilian open source professionals here in Brazil. And since that time, we've been, I've been coming back time and time again, helping to represent the Linux Professional Institute, something which allows you to get trained any way you want to, by reading a book, by going to the internet, by self-training, self-experience, by taking courses. And then you take an exam to get your certification. I also, at the same time, visited a favela in Sao Paulo where they were teaching students how to do open source. They were teaching students how to program in C. LPI today has a series of different courses. We start off with Linux Essentials, even for people that don't even know how to use a computer, to teach them how to use Linux, how to use LibreOffice, and how to be useful in the office using free software. We also have three different levels of systems administration courses, which include security, database, and mixed systems. And we recently launched a course called DevOps, which does not teach you how to do DevOps, but means that you know the tools for doing DevOps. This year, we've embraced BSD. We're doing certifications for the BSD system. And we're also creating a course which we call BOSS, the Business of Open Source Software. How many of you have had supervisors or managers or presidents of your company that do not understand what free software is about? And it's been hard for you to convince them that you're right. Well, we're developing a certification for your BOSS. And your boss can go to the website and see all the different objectives that means that they are knowledgeable about open source. And if they don't know those things, then they should learn about them, shouldn't they? And then eventually they can get certified as being a true boss. We're also developing a course in Internet of Things and Internet of Things Essentials for open source and including embedded systems. And these will be av out available in the last quarter of this year or first quarter of next. We're also transitioning to a membership-based organization. In 1999, when I helped to start LPI, we, only ha we had zero certified members, and so it's hard to have a member organization. Now we have 150,000 certificate holders in 180 countries in the world. And now we're going to have a membership model where you are going to be the members. You are going to be the people electing the board of directors. You are going to be the people determining where we go in the future. And we're going to develop services and discounts for you. It is my hope that the services and discounts more than pay for your membership. Second base is suitable open hardware. In 2012, I begged the Raspberry Pi people to come to Brazil and to find out why the Raspberry Pi that costs $35 in the United States costs $150 when you tried to buy it in Brazil. And we actually produced 10 of them 
five by the University of Sao Paulo, and five by a private corporation. And after two years of working with us, the Raspberry Pi Foundation said no. So I went to a small company in Shenzhen, China, who made the Banana Pi and the Banana Pro. And I said, please, would you make your computers here in Brazil? And they said, no. But along the way, they developed another little computer called the guitar, which is actually way superior to the Raspberry Pi. It does cost more money, I will admit. But after six months, they finally said yes to me. And so we created an agreement for an NGO called LSI Tech, which is part of the University of Sao Paulo, to start producing these in large quantities. But instead, made with Brazilian parts by Brazilian people here in Brazil. And so, taking all of the taxes into account, making a completely legal system, we can produce this for five US dollars more than they can in Taiwan. And we will be selling these in large quantities in October of this year. This is a brief description of it. You can go to Casinas, uh, yeah. Uh, ooh, I'm having a mental blank here. Caninas Lucas, thank you. CaninasLucas.org and see all of the specifications. We believe that this will create flexibility in designs which are produced here in Brazil and will be able to give longevity to those designs. We believe we have three different parts to the program of Caninus Lucas. One part of it, the smallest part, is called the flea or the pulga. We were going to call it the chihuahua, but then we realized that nobody loves chihuahuas. And so we said, we have the flea, a very, very tiny sensor computer that has about eight to 10 sensors on it, temperature, accelerometer, even a microphone. It uses Bluetooth uh, mesh and LoRaWAN to communicate and can run off of a watch battery for about six months or if you gang the watch batteries together for a year. We can produce 250,000 of these every day on our line. We also have the Labrador, which is the renamed guitar, and of course, the broadband router. And these three systems are the hardware platform for the national plan of Internet of Things of the Brazilian government. The Brazilian government is investing 10 billion US dollars in this plan over the next 10 years, because they figure it will produce $200 billion of products in the next 10 years. They're looking at about one-tenth of the Brazilian GDP being somehow tied to Internet of Things, and they need 1% of the Brazilian population trained in Internet of Things. Everybody agrees that Internet of Things should be open source or free software, because it's too dangerous not to have it that way. The third base, of course, is Subutai peer-to-peer cloud software. I've already described that, so I will not describe it anymore. Now we have the bases loaded. We're going to hit a home run. We're going to introduce a way that university students and anybody else can actually make money with free software. By putting products on the Labrador, like Udu, which is a point of sale and ERP system, people will be able to buy these and help small store owners maintain their point of sale and Internet of Things, uh, I'm sorry, point of sale and ERP systems and make money doing that. You won't have to ask anybody's permission. You won't have to pay anybody any royalty. You won't have to have a boss. You can buy one of these, go to, this, go to the website, pull down the software, and sell them if you wish. 
We could also put Kodi on these with a little bit of security software and Internet of Things software, allow people to control their homes and have access to the Internet. Or you could put it on here and have a super Internet of Things and multimedia system. There's lots of other solutions that could be created using open source hardware and software. My last slide, or more or less my last slide. 2019, next year is a very important year. It's the 50th anniversary of Unix. The 50th anniversary of the internet. Linus Torvalds will be 50 years old. I wrote my first program in 1969. It was the year of Woodstock and free love. It was the last year I ever shaved. <laughs> and next year, we're going to have a DebConf in Curitiba where all the Debian developers are going to be coming, and I promise you, we're going to have a party. Because I am also a part owner of Hop and Roll Beer Club in Curitiba. 29 different beers on, dra on draft, and they're all artisan beers. No skull, no Brahma. <laughs> and by that time, I hope that hundreds of thousands of young people trying to go to university, trying to make enough money to, for their apartment, their, their internet, and things like that, will be selling Project Kawa solutions to their customers. What I've been saying to you is not about me. It's about you. Your, your country, your future, your families. You can continue to send billions of reais outside of Brazil to the United States to buy software that is no better, in fact, a lot of cases worse, than the software that we represent here. You can continue to send billions and billions of reais out of your country to China or the United States for things that you can design and build here. You can continue to do all of that instead of using free software and open source hardware designed and manufactured here and then use that money that you pay to local people to buy local food, local housing, and local taxes. You can continue to do that. So yes, like the last speaker said, we have another duty besides just writing software. We don't. We have to get other people to use it. And so my challenge to you is that next year you find two people to bring to this conference who are not open source users. I want you to bring your representative. I want you to bring your school teachers. I want you to bring the people that make decisions here so that they can hear and feel what is the power of this community. And next year, they will bring two more people, and then two more people. That's what we have to do. It is not enough just to create the software. And finally, a quote from one of my favorite people in all the world, Rear Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, the first modern-day programmer in the United States. She led the task force to create the language COBOL when people said she was crazy. And she said, a ship in port is safe, but that's not where ships were built for, to stay in port. They were built to sail across the sea, to take danger into account. And we have to build Brazil first, and with Brazil, the rest of Latin America. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? I'll be around at the coffee break. You're welcome to talk to me then. I'll be around for the rest of the day. Thank you again. <laughs>